Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the latest edition of Odyssey House Journals. Whenever you're watching this, I'm Randall Carlisle, along with Rachel Santizo. Hi, Rach. Hi. I just wanted to thank all of our several thousand viewers and listeners who we have. This is becoming one of the most popular podcasts to talk about addiction and recovery. People can watch it on YouTube. Just Google Odyssey House Journals. Listen to it on Spotify. Uh, iTunes, iHeart, a whole bunch of different places. So did you know you have that many people who tune in just to watch you, Rachel? Uh-uh, I didn't. That's pretty incredible. We'll say hi to them all. Hi, oh. everyone. <laughs> we try to start out with a news story, and this one really applied to me since I'm a recovering alcoholic. It's a, a new study by the New York Times says, while many people with alcohol use disorder, an alcoholic, visit a doctor, very few receive treatment for their drinking. It says about 80% of people who meet the criteria for alcohol use disorder had visited a doctor, hospital, or medical clinic for a variety of reasons in the past year. About 70% were asked about their alcohol intake, but only 10% were encouraged to get help for their drinking by their health professional. Did it say why? No, I, it said, uh, no, it really didn't say why. And I can relate. I had a very good general practitioner or doctor uh, the, all my decades of being an, alcohol, an alcoholic. And I would go in and he would say, how much are you drinking? And, and you know, I would always lie about it. And, and, it, and even the last time that I had blood tests done, this was years ago, and it showed that my liver functions were, were not as good as they should be, he said, maybe you ought to think about cutting back. Do you think it's uneducation, not being aware of the options out there? I, I'm not sure whether they're maybe just hesitant to say, you know, you've got a significant alcohol problem and you need to get some help. Uh, for fear of making me angry or something, I don't know, but but obviously it's something happening, you know, everywhere. So, yeah. it, and, it, and I think it and possibly because it's a legal substance, mm -hmm. and and you know, and, and if the doc knew you were using meth or heroin or something like that, they might take a different approach. Right, it'd be easier. Um, definitely, it'd be easier to just place that blame because it's illegal, but since it's right, legal, right. it's easy to be like, oh, well, you're drinking legally, so it's okay. So anyway, I'm glad I got help, even though my doctor didn't recommend it. <laughs> Who, I'm glad you did too. <laughs> if both of us, I think, make more sense sober, we couldn't be doing this podcast if we were still using, right? We definitely wouldn't be friends, for sure. <laughs> okay, so you got today's guest to agree to come on and be our next victim, no, our next guest. I think victims fair for sure. Um, yeah, Kevin Howe, I'm so excited. He has a lot of different aspects to his story. So we're going to hear a lot of different angles from cancer to addiction. I just, I can't wait for him to explain a lot of different angles that we all need to hear. And so this courageous gentleman is, without further ado, is going to explain to us all these different angles. So Kevin, please. Hi, Rachel. Randall, oh, thank you. you. Um, and yeah, she... thank you for inviting me to do this. I, I'm very honored to to share my story. Um, sharing my story is part of my recovery. Mm -hmm. so, All of us. Thank you for being part of, of my recovery process. So um, yeah, my addiction began, I would say about 2009 is when it started. I worked on the railroad and I was a railroad engineer. And I worked from Chicago, Illinois to Cleveland, Ohio was where my route was. We worked horrible hours. We worked in a horrible working condition and cocaine was the best way to make it through the day. And it was okay. It was uh, culturally acceptable in, in that work field. Um, and that's probably when my addiction began to amphetamines. Um, I began using cocaine and in 2012, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And wow. um, this kind of hit home. It was a wide awakening that something's gonna change. And so um, my amphetamine use did not change with this. Um, it, 
my addiction really did control what I my what, what I went through. In 2012 and 2013, I went through chemo. I went through radiation, and um, it took about a year uh, through different types of therapies. And the cancer was, um, they pretty much said it was gone, that I didn't have any cancer left. I was able to keep my prostate, so that's good. Um, a lot good. of people with prostate cancer, especially at my age, I just turned 40, literally uh, the 23rd. So um, a lot of people my age lose their prostate or could lose their prostate and be on, um, you know, um, what's the word I want to use? Hormone. Um, hormone therapy. There we go. Yeah. Uh, the rest of their lives. And so uh, I'm lucky there. So my story began, I was in the Midwest and um, really struggled with my health. And this was a time when Obamacare was starting to take effect. 2014 was the big year for Obamacare. And I received treatment in the University of Louisville for my cancer. And at the time, the state of Kentucky was challenging the lifetime limit of Obamacare. And I remember this really distinctively. I had a conversation with my doctor. Um, Kentucky was challenging this, so it, it did not take effect in Kentucky. There still was a lifetime limit of 2.5 million um, in Medicare, medical expenses the government would pay. And my doctor said, leave Kentucky. That was his, that was his recommendation to me. He said, you will need treatment, you will need follow-ups, you will need testing and um, Kentucky, you will not be able to afford it here. So I moved to the state of Washington. Um, so let's go back to while I was doing that. I got my master's degree at the University of Louisville. So wow. concurrently, while I was going through treatment, I got my master's degree. And it was really, in my life, that's a milestone. In um, December of 2013 was when I received my master's. And that was the same time when the doctor said, it's time to go. You, We need to find another state for you to go to and make this transition smooth. And so I moved to the state of Washington. And all the while you're using amphetamine still? Oh yeah, the whole time. Okay. The whole time I had a, a doctor that um, I had switched from cocaine to Adderall. Adderall began my drug of choice and it was my legal coke. That's how I looked at it. Um, it wasn't an issue. It, it's actually an you know, legal meth, I guess you could say it, but not really legal, I guess, or illegal. But what Adderall became for me was a crutch. Um, it became a way for me to manage my trauma from the railroad, um, my trauma from cancer, um, my trauma that I had experienced for about four years. Um, some of the, the undealt trauma that I chose not to deal with was while I was working on the railroad, there were several suicide by trains that I experienced. Wow. And I had a coworker who passed away um, at work. He was crushed by part of the train and a load shifted and I never dealt with it. And so that trauma, um, the cancer trauma and um, Adderall went to what went with me to Washington. And um, that's where I began a pretty successful career and a pretty successful um, manipulation of doctors to get my drugs, a very successful manipulation of really anyone in my healthcare to get Adderall. Um, it was, I'm, I will just call it manipulation. That's what it was. <laughs> okay. all, so, all, all addicts and alcoholics are, are great liars and manipulators, right? Yes. We, we are, yes, and we're very creative yeah. as to how we do that. Yes. Um, so I, I, would, and I moved to Utah in 2018 um, for a job change here in Utah, and at that, would, that was part of the height of my Adderall use. Um, I was using a month's worth of Adderall in about two days. Jeez. And um, staying up for about a week or so afterwards, no sleep. And then a couple of days of recovery, and then I, I was sober. And so there's this chunk every month of time where I'm just a totally different person. And um, I became very lucky. I, I have a partner who's very supportive of me going through recovery. Um, but we have had some pretty rough times with, with my, my use. Um, 
all came to a head last year in October. So my sobriety date is October 3rd is when I stopped using Adderall completely. October 1st was when I got my prescription and I took an entire month's worth of Adderall in one day. And um, my partner and I had a physical altercation that um, led to me really just turning into a beast. I just destroyed our house. Um, I have a, a two dogs and they, I didn't do anything hurtful to them, but um, they were, they're s still shocked a little bit sometimes. They, the click of the medicine bottle, they are attentive. Um, and I had a choice to make on October 2nd was, do I stay with my partner or do I stay with Adderall? Those are my options. And um, I remember sitting at the dining room table and sweat's just pouring off my body. Um, sweat is pooling on the table and I couldn't do it. Either. I was like, this is it. I can't do it. I'm done. And so that's when I decided to get help. And I went to Recovery Ways and started the process. I had a friend at Recovery Ways. She is, um, she's an amazing person. And um, it was tough. I am a strong, independent person. <laughs> Going to recovery was being dependent on others. And that was very uncomfortable for me. Um, I was at Recovery Ways for uh, 30, about 30 days. And um, what they taught me wasn't that um, I, I knew Adderall was bad. It wasn't, an, it wasn't that I was confused that, oh, this is a good thing or a bad thing. No, no, I knew it was inappropriate, unhealthy, illegal. Um, I was aware of that. But what Recovery Ways taught me was the trauma that I had, the experiences that I've had in life really fostered this idea that I had that I needed a crutch. And um, I do need a crutch. That's just some trauma. And I do need a crutch. I need to find a different crutch. I need to find a different way to support myself than through drug use. And they provided resources for that. Um, and my connection with Rachel is through FTR, um, Fit to Recovery. And that is my outlet during when I was going through treatment. We so, went, so is, um, that, is that your crutch now? Is it physical exercise? Yeah. Okay. I am a, I cannot sit still. I'm sitting here kind of twitching a little bit already, but um, <laughs> yeah, exercise is, is something I need. I'm, I'm like, when a dog doesn't get exercise, they're, they're different. They're a different dog, you know? <laughs> and when I don't get exercise, I'm a different person. Um, and it taught me that I needed to provide a little structure, just a little structure, a little bit of an awareness of what I was doing and I can do this. And so, yeah, FTR has been um, really a way for me to meet people who are not going to judge me. It has been a way for me to connect with others who maybe been through some trauma themselves. Um, and it's a safe place. And I think for the most of my adult life, I have not lived in a safe place. When I say that, I mean, um, not physically unsafe, but emotionally unsafe. Right. I just didn't have that support. Let me I ask you, uh, you, you said, because uh, a lot of people who don't understand uh, addiction always wonder, what is it that motivated you to seek treatment? And, and you, you mentioned the fact that it was either your partner or, or the Adderall. Uh, and, and we usually say at Odyssey, I mean, that you, you have to want to do it for yourself primarily, mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, my partner is forcing me to do it or, or, right. or, or the courts are forcing me to do it and everything. What, what were you actually doing it just so you could keep your relationship together? Or were you thinking inwardly that there was a reason to do it for yourself as well? I was definitely thinking inwardly. Um, one of the things that we just, my partner and I discussed was just what you talked about, that w this isn't about Kevin um, and Travis. This is about Kevin. And um, we were very intentional. The time that I was in treatment, we did not communicate. 
Um, and we've been together for three and a half years now. And we were intentional that this is a time for me to focus on me. And that um, really allowed me to really reflect on my strengths and my weaknesses. What are they and how can we fix them? Where before my weaknesses, Travis would always cover, you know, he would always support me. They weren't in my face, something I had to deal with. So when it, when um, now in my time, my recovery, um, my Saturday mornings, I, Travis just knows that's my time. I go to FTR, I have coffee afterwards, I eat breakfast by myself, and I usually will take a hike somewhere by myself. Um, and it's a time to be, um, for me to reflect, just to be aware of what I'm doing and why this is healthy for me. Um, I'll share that in 2016, while I was in Washington, my cancer came back and um, it was um, more aggressive and um, it metastasized into my um, anal canal. And I've had eight surgeries where I've had my anal canal completely removed. I have a stoma now um, and I'm very proud of it. It's not a secret or anything, but uh, I love my stoma. He's got, his name's Trevor. Um, <laughs> and we talk about Trevor all the time, you know, Trevor's feeling, how he's doing. But one of the things that I remember distinctly after my surgery was the doctor told me that my stoma is not a vessel for drugs. And it was a conversation I it was odd because I didn't really admit that I was abusing drugs, but it was a conversation I had with my surgeon that he was very intentional that your stoma is not a vessel for drug use. Um, and it, it, it actually is common that people who abuse drugs use stoma. It's a, the intestine is exposed. And so it's a direct bloodline. Um, but he was, so I, I reflect back on different times in my recovery. I think doctors knew, but they didn't want to address it maybe, or they thought it was odd. When I was in the hospital, I got my Adderall. It was one the one drug I could rely on to be there. People who go through cancer often have a lot of fatigue. And Adderall was a tool that I used to try and overcome that and was able to convince doctors that I needed it. So, how important how important do you think it is staying connected to the recovery community? We we preach that all the time at Odyssey and I think most treatment centers saying when you get done here, you know, you can't just go back to your lifestyle the way it was before. You got to you either go to 12 step meetings or go to FTR or uh, you know, there's so many recovery groups. Uh, go to USARA once a week, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, how important do you think that is? I, I think it's extremely important. I think it's why I'm still sober. Um, I think that one of the challenges I have is I'm a person, I'm personal. I do not want to share things about my life with people. And addiction has taught me that that doesn't work. It will not work. And who do I share this with? But fellow people, other people who went through this, they understand what it's like to be in a, in a treatment center, or they understand the feeling of wanting the cravings when they come back. Um, I do have, I made connections with three people while I was in uh, treatment that I stay in contact with daily. And they challenge me. How are you doing? What are you doing? Tell me where you're at. Um, they are very on my, on my side. They're supportive. The FCR community, I would say I'm not as open there. I, I usually show up and I just am there. But what's important about that community is it's stable. I, I often do not have that stability in my life. And the FTR community is stable. And that I think is something that people who are trying to recover from addictions, stability is just crucial. And having that connection is what promotes my sobriety and what keeps it. I have friends back home in Indiana who every now and then I'll get a text I, that I told I went to treatment. How are you doing? How long have you been sober? And it's not a, hi, how's your day? No, no, no. It's are you, how, how's your sobriety going? And that I think is what's important to not take it personally, like they're coming at me, but that they're interested in me and they, they truly care about me. Um, 
Rachel, Rachel and I talk all the time because we have the same length of sobriety. So we say to each other, we're, we've got nine years clean now. We say, hey, happy birthday, Rachel. Great. Right. Yeah. I think what the the community being involved in a community what it does for me I, I've only been I mean we're going on not even a year yet but I see people in that community wow they've got eight years they've got nine years and they can do it so can I and it allows me an opportunity to see what long-term sobriety looks like that it is possible well, we celebrated on Saturday morning it wasn't too long ago we celebrated something for you yeah, so, well, are you talking about at work? At work and your cancer. There was a couple things we've celebrated. Yeah, so I went through cancer treatment again um, and the, for a third time. And so we're celebrating that. I, I am no longer cancer. I've, they call it no evidence of disease. So mm -hmm. that's the, the thing. My boldness, though, I can't really blame that on, on cancer or chemo. But um, yeah, it's... And what I've learned about cancer, and I would say the same as with addiction, is that you have to be monitoring and aware of it constantly. And we all have cancer. Cancer is an abnormal cell. And that's what it is. And when it becomes out of control and it affects your body in ways that you don't expect, then that becomes a problem. Most of us have immune systems that can handle it. Same thing with addiction. We all have cravings. We all have these desires to maybe reuse but we have to keep them in check and say this cannot control my life and for my cancer it's my doctor's team sure. that helps me and for my recovery and my addiction it's the communities that i'm involved with this this i could not do this alone you know I, I, you were as you were talking about your your situation there, if people watching this who don't understand addiction and what it does to your brain you seem like yeah. such a nice guy okay yeah and and, and, <laughs> you. and you were saying how you, you know you were a nice guy most of the time but like the the last time you used when you did a month's supply of adderall in a day you turned into a beast and yeah. and and that's really not who you are but it's sort of the drug hijacking your brain uh I mean, how would you describe yourself in general as a person sober or a person high? So sober, um, sober, I'm focused. I am calm. I am um, independent and I'm straightforward. I shoot straight from the hip. When I'm high, I am not focused. I am, I do not want to be around anyone. And I believe I can conquer the world. And if you're in my way, I'll run you over. And I have, I have no empathy. You know what? You're in my way, move. Or I'll run you over. And after I run you over, well, if you're still in my way, I'll do it again. I, have, I really had no care. And that was the thing with Travis. Like we, it, we didn't turn physical, but I definitely did some damage to our house and property damage. Um, that was not me. I, I am not a person who can rip down doors, who can damage furniture. That's not something I do. Um, and so what the way I would change, but I would say, well, I'm just normal. This is just me. It's you that's got the problem. You're the one perceiving me as this beast. That's your perception, your problem. No, no, no. It's I'm communicating this it's not their problem it's actually my problem and so my and it would always start out little or it started out little anyway one pill turned to two pills turned to five pills that turned to why are we counting this this <laughs> happened over time this happened many many years uh, oh i'm going to the gym oh, i'll take a handful and um or i i know i've got a stressful meeting coming up i'll save a few over here and I'll put some in my office drawer and, and have some in my better. car and have, yep, different stashes. You know, yeah. yeah. Yep. And yeah. go ahead. So I want to know, like, what are you doing now? And with work, you got some incredible things going on. With we, work? we have a few minutes left. And so we have yeah. to see what you're doing with work. Cause I'm super proud of you and you're very deserving. And so let's go over what you're doing with work. 
Yeah, sure. So in Washington, I started, um, I worked with sex offenders. So they are um, sexually violent predators and they're termed SVPs. And my job, I am on their side, essentially. Um, they are going through a process called civil commitment in Washington state. Utah is trying to get a similar state or state law passed. So one of the um, things I did in Washington was I provided them with an opportunity for education as part of their sex offender treatment. And um, I am not a sex offender therapist by any means. That's not my area of expertise. Mine is education and the education component of sex offender therapy. And in Washington state, they believe that it is the foundation of sex offender therapy. And so finding sex offenders, formal education, in the data shows prevents recidivism. And that is what we're doing. And we're, I wouldn't say convincing, but collecting data um, to show that sex offender therapy is not something that people should be afraid of. It is something that is beneficial, not just to the offender itself, but the community that the offender lives in. That it is a tool to support. Um, and in Washington state, the sex offenders that will go into sex offender therapy through the SVP program out of prison are on, on, on a place called McNeil Island. And it's, it's literally an island. And Washington state has this law, as do uh, 22 states with civil commitment, where civil commitment is either you go to treatment and you'll re, re, uh, transition into the community when you're finished, when the therapist says so, or you're there indefinitely. It's an indefinite sentence. Um, and treatment is years. It's not something that happens within a couple weeks. You know, it's, it's a year, years. Of, pro of constant support. And for the sex offender, it's a, it's challenging their, their risk factors. Um, and as someone who is a addict, my risk factors, we all have risk factors. We're aware of them. And uh, the population in Washington that we really worked with, uh, they also have mental abnormalities that go with their their crimes. So it makes it a little more challenging. But and um, substance use issues too. Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. And um, a lot of sexual deviancies that go play into this. And our role in education is we don't, I don't even want to know about those. I mean, I know them. But that's not my focus. My focus is tomorrow. What are we doing the next day? What are we doing today? Your history is your history. Let's talk about today. And that today involves education. So, yeah, I could talk. I could. Well, we don't have enough time to talk about this. So I could do it all day. <laughs> but it gets really fascinating. A lot of the public is not aware that this is a thing. That sex offenders have an option to go into therapy. What? What? They shouldn't be provided therapy. I get that feedback a lot. Why are you doing that? My parents are one of them. Why are you doing this? This is not something that would help the community. Lock them up. No. That, that's the general attitude. And one of the, one of the problems, because I get calls all the time from uh, like VOA detox and places, uh, they'll say, Can, uh, I've got a guy who's on the sex offender registry and he wants treatment for his uh, heroin addiction. And most treatment centers will not take somebody who's on the sex offender registry. Right. So it's difficult. Yeah. It's very challenging. And so, um, right with education, most sex offenders are not allowed online access. And how do we communicate in a COVID world in education? Through Zoom. And so, oh, how do you get your material? Through the internet. Um, so it's really challenging to provide something that we know is the foundation of their therapy and their recovery. And they're challenging their issues and being successful. But yet the law says they don't get access to it. Yeah. So that's something that we work with um, and that we try to address. We do address that. There's many of these things, Randall, like you like you talked about. Living is one of them. Um, employment is another one sure. that's really a challenge. Uh, most, um, we use places like nurseries, uh, plant nurseries, 
where they can go and do stuff that with landscaping, they're not around people per se, and children typically are not there after night, um, where they're able to do things like upholstery or things that there is not a risk for them. And that's what sex furniture therapy is mostly about, reducing the risk and then teaching how to navigate that system when you feel stimulated or you feel right. a craving, if you will. Kevin, we are out of time. I want to thank you for joining. Yes. Thank you for uh, for having me. I really appreciate this. I think this there? is just an, another tool to, to help people in their recovery. So thank you both for inviting me. I appreciate it. Great. Final thought, Rachel, you another yeah. good guest. Kevin, you're amazing. And so thank you for coming on here. I couldn't wait to have you on this show. And so I love and adore you and thank you for being you. You're welcome. Thanks for sharing. Uh, and thank you for watching another edition of Odyssey House Journals.